Views and opinions expressed on this platform are of me, myself, and I, not any agency I'm affiliated with. So please do not take what I say personally. Going on part, no, I'm not going to say, I'm going to say that in a second, hold on. So, I'm going to handle the introduction since Alexis is struggling a little bit here. This is going to be the second take of this recording. We had some, uh, let's just call it technical difficulties. It appears that microphones don't work very well if they're not plugged in. That's hateful. Um, It's the truth, though. So, uh, yeah, welcome to the podcast. Do you want to do your little intro spiel now that I got the... uh, I got over that hump for you. Thank you. Um, for anyone that's ever recorded with me, you understand every episode, I literally do this thing where I go to speak and I stop and I'm like, I don't know how I'm going to start this. So it's the same one every time. But from the great state of Louisiana with many, I don't want to say interesting people, but there are just a different breed of people from Louisiana that differ from around the world. And In that great state, in this great home, we have Cecil Fairchild. Cecil, I'm going to let you introduce yourself this time because I did it last time and it was a whole lot. So I'm going to let you introduce yourself. He has a lot behind his last name. He has a lot of great accomplishments, great feats. Now that I've brought you up and I even talk about how humble you are, go ahead, introduce yourself, tell the people who you are, what you stand for. Cool. Okay. So... Um, yeah, I guess you're going to have like a secret unreleased episode. This was the first day. <laughs> but yeah, so my name is Cecil Fairchild. Thanks for having me on. Um, a little bit about myself. So I have a couple of different things that I do. I'm, I work full time as a flight paramedic in central Louisiana. I've been doing that for a little over five years. For about five years, I've been a paramedic since 2014, and I've been working in EMS since 2000. In 12, I've worked as a ground paramedic, ground critical care, flight medic, firefighter. Um, I am a also a flight medic with the Louisiana National Guard, go dust off. I am a SWAT medic with my sheriff's office back home. And I also really enjoy education, which I think we're going to talk about a little bit. I really enjoy education. I've worked as an instructor and as a uh, director of education doing some flight, critical care, paramedic education, a whole lot of things like that letters i've got my nrp i have my fpc the flight paramedic certification tpc the tactical paramedic certification and i've also been lucky enough to complete my associates of applied science in ems so i was really excited about that and i'm sure there's some other stuff that i do which honestly i'm probably forgetting about Uh, i like to say i just get bored too easy so i start to do a whole lot of different things so a whole lot of diverse background if you will and that's Cecil that's one of the things I admire about you is that you were I feel like you're the epitome of the understanding that EMS is not just on the ground it's not just in the air there's so many aspects and avenues of EMS that somebody can get into yeah definitely and and I will be the first to say it's I don't think a lot of it is because I'm just I, I'm not just so great that all this stuff fell into my lap But I think I'm just lucky in a lot of ways. I've just so happened to to meet and to know the right people at the right time. And I've had a lot of really cool opportunities which have been afforded to me that, like I said, I get bored too easy. So I jumped on top of and kind of took it and ran with it. So that's how I ended up where I am today. So one of the first things I want to get into about who you are, um, tell me about your transition from working on the ground to going in the air. Because one of the things I say is that, like, when people ask me, like, what's your next step? Are you going to be a flight medic? It is so hard. Like, the back of the ambulance, or in my agency, Vambulance. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> me too. It is so hard being in the back of that when the space is already so small to going into the space the size of a porta potty in flight. It's at least two porta potties, I think. Oh, wow. It's, Deluxe. I think it's at least two porta potties, depending on which airframe you're flying in. Ours is a solid two porta potties. Some of the smaller <laughs> aircraft, yeah, you're probably dealing with one. So <laughs> tell me about the transition from ground pounding to flight medic and what that entails. Yeah. So this is, it's actually probably a question I get asked a lot because I think for so many people, whenever they are in EMS, 
and they start looking at career progression. They start looking at what they want to do next. It always seems as though you can go one of three ways. You can become a supervisor, you can become an educator, or you can go into flight medicine. Flight, you can become a flight medic. And flight medic seems to be one of the more attractive ones to so many people. You know, it's just, it's the cool one. You get to fly in helicopters and all that, and everybody's really excited about that. And I'll be honest, that's kind of what got me into it. You know, I wanted to do the job that was cool in my mind. I wanted to fly in helicopters. I wanted to do all this stuff. So I knew from a very early point in my EMS career that I wanted to be a flight medic. So everything I did was in preparation and gearing myself up to take that position. So knew I wanted to do it, put in the work, did the study, and started doing the critical care transport on the ground side, started studying for the FPC and all of that good stuff. And then I was just lucky enough that whenever an opening came up, I applied, did the interview process, and I was able to get it, and I started doing it. The transition from being a ground medic to being a flight medic was, that was a steep learning curve. I will definitely say that. On the ground side, whenever you're a paramedic in general, we are used to being the one, right? We are used to being, whenever somebody calls 911, we show up and we are the person responsible. We are the one taking charge, calling the shots. On the air medical side of things, and I, and I don't say this in a bragging way, but in, in many instances, we are 911's 911. We get the call whenever the patient is extremely critical. We get the call whenever the inner facility transfer is especially complicated. And they need a higher level of care to show up and, and to be able to take care. And I'm, once again, I'm not saying that in a way to brag and be like, oh my God, we're, we're, we're great and all this other type of stuff, but that's just the nature of the beast. So I was a very comfortable ground medic. I, I felt very comfortable and confident in my ability to show up and manage these patients. And then when I transitioned to the air side, for the first year that I was flying, I was sitting in the aircraft shaking on my way to every call because I did not want to be the guy that showed up, got off the aircraft, everybody expected to know what to do, and I got out and I was the proverbial dumb <laughs> I did not want to be that guy. I wanted to show up, know what needed to be done, do it, and do it efficiently and effectively. So that was a steep learning curve. Also, there is always a... You're going to have a wider scope of practice, more tools, policies, procedures, and everything else that you can use on the flight side than on the ground side. So now I was having to learn how to do an RSI, which if you've ever been trained on it, you know that's, that's a big thing. You've got to be used to that, or not used to that. You have to, you have to respect that procedure. Uh, surgical cricothyrotomies, blood administration, TXA, and, and all of these different things that, well, at least whenever I started in air medical side of things was specific to what we did. We didn't have any of that stuff on the ground. So that was definitely another really, really steep learning curve. And the transition, I would say, it was definitely a challenge. It was a challenge, but it was one that I was really excited to do. And I think, you know, I think it went fairly well. So it's kind of my transition story. I want to touch on something you talked about, about being the calm one and stuff like that. That is one of the things that I feel like anytime we call for flight and and this is the part where I say when we call for flight and they actually show up because there could be a cloud in oh, the yeah, sky. Oh yeah, because it's raining in China so the aircraft can't fly. <laughs> if I had a dollar for every time somebody told me that, I would I would not have to work, honestly. But, but it's it's, o- it's okay though because I'll be honest when I was working ground side at my agency, I said the exact same thing all the time. I think it's just a rite of passage. You have to gripe about it, and then when you get on the other side of things, you're griping about people griping about it. So, yeah. Well, it's hard because, like you said, and I've never put it this way and this spot on, flight medics are the field paramedics 911. Whenever it's a patient that we don't – it's not that we don't know how to manage because we always go back to ABCs, but – when it's something beyond our capability, it's someone that we could intubate, but we can't because they need to be RSI. And if you don't know what RSI is, that's rapid sequence intubation. The flight medics can push the drugs to paralyze somebody, to sedate somebody, and then get a hold of the airway and intubate them with the ET tube. So it's our, y'all are our 911. And so for, I remember being a baby basic EMT. I think it was the first flight call I ever had was me like glued to the side of the ambulance just watching everything i'm panicking my paramedic is not panicking but we're also like we're both freaking out because this patient is going down the drain rapidly 
the flight crew got there. They open the back doors and like they're just nice, chill. Hey guys, what's going on? They come in, start putting stickers on the patient. They start doing all the things, and I'm just like sweating. <laughs> <laughs> so like, is there imposter syndrome with that? Where you have to like, even though you're oh. like you said, you're shaking on the way to the oh, call, like my God. all that. Yes, absolutely. And and I will tell you that I think imposter syndrome is at at low levels it's kind of a healthy thing to have. I think it's really something that keeps you humble in the grand scheme of things. And I will tell you that in the beginning, yeah, I definitely struggled with that a lot. And there's even still sometimes to this day where I'm like, man, am I really am I really the guy? Am I really the one for this? And but there's a whole lot that goes into that. As I said, I think it's a really good thing that we all remain humble, that we all recognize there are going to be things that we don't know. There are going to be patients that are going to challenge us. Actually, I was talking to a new paramedic last week, I think it was, and we were talking about, hey, how's everything going now that he was clear and going through his orientation and everything? And I said, you know, do you feel like you're getting it? He said, man, I start to feel like I'm getting it, and then I'll get this one call and it just, I don't, I feel like I don't know what I'm doing. And I said, listen, that is going to happen. I don't care how long you've been doing EMS, how long you've been a paramedic for, or anything else like that. That is going to happen. And if anybody ever tells you it doesn't happen to them, they're a liar and they're not humble. And that is going to always happen to you throughout your career. The only thing that's going to change is how frequently it happens to you. And the goal is to try and de- decrease the frequency that you experience that sensation and recognizing it's still going to happen. So seeing that and realizing that, um, you have to take the steps to to be able to mitigate it, right? Like you don't want to not know what you're doing. So I like to say in order to be that calm, cool, and collected, got it all together, cool guy whenever you show up on scene, the first and most important thing is you have to get a good pair of sunglasses. Because whenever you get out of the aircraft and you put on the Ray-Ban aviators and you saunter up to the aircraft, that sets the tone. I'm just kidding. I'm 100% just kidding. But people always give me, if I had a dollar for every time somebody made a Top Gun or a Goose joke, once again, I would not have to work a lot of overtime. But it all begins with the preparation, right? It begins with recognizing that I need to be prepared for what I don't know. It's identifying, last week I had a call where this patient presented with XYZ and I wasn't prepared for it. So I went home and I studied that. Actually, I kind of remember way back whenever I was a first, um, whenever I was a a fairly brand new paramedic, we were dispatched to a call for a kid. He was a nine-year-old and he had an Addison's crisis. And I remember we were going to this call, it was in a really rural area, and I was like, Addison's crisis, what the, what do I do for that, you know, what, what is this? And I was trying to Google it on my way to the call, and I wasn't able to because we didn't have cell service where we were, it was really rural, it was just a mess. We get there and the kid was in a true blue crisis, and I was doing everything I could think of to do to try and take care of him. Uh, they did dispatch our aircraft, the aircraft landed, I helped the flight medic get the patient packaged up, we loaded him in the aircraft. The aircraft departed, and before they even cleared the yard, they had to come back in and land because the kid had arrested. So, unloaded the kid from the aircraft, put him in a ground unit, worked him on the way to the hospital. And the kid ended up, you know, making a recovery and everything else. But I I remember that feeling of not knowing what to do and of being completely dumbfounded and, and blindsided and thinking to myself, I refuse to ever feel that way again. And... I hate that it took an incident like that for me to really kind of embrace it because I always wanted to learn stuff. But until you have one of those solidifying experiences, that's whenever you really take it to heart and you start to think, okay, I remember how I felt that day. I never want to feel that way again. And that was kind of what pushed me in a lot of ways. So beginning with the preparation, realizing that you don't know what you don't know and trying to mitigate that as much as possible. The next thing I would say is that your attitude on a scene is contagious. For me, I make it a point to be as overly calm as possible. So whenever things are stressful, whenever it's a high stress environment and everything's happening at once, I put extra effort into being slow and deliberate and talking calmly. 
we've probably all been on calls before where the paramedic or somebody was losing their mind all over the place, and that's contagious because, hey, this is the paramedic. This is the guy that's supposed to know what to do. He's nervous. He's anxious. He doesn't know what he's doing. That is contagious, and everybody else is going to begin to feel that same way. So whenever we show up as a flight crew with that expectation that, hey, we're going to be the ones to be able to fix it and take care of it, we need to be able to communicate that same sensation. When I first got hired as an EMT, the manager that hired me used the analogy. He said, I'm looking to hire ducks. And I was like, ducks? What are you talking about? Ducks? Like, I'm a person. I'm not a duck. Um, but he said, I want somebody, if you look at a duck, when they're in a pond, they're floating around on the surface, and it just looks effortless. You don't see anything happening. They're just floating around, barely disturbing the water. But if you look under the water, their feet are sitting there kicking away at 100 miles an hour. He said, I want that no matter how much your feet are kicking under the surface, that you look calm, cool, collected, and smooth on the top. And that always kind of stuck with me, and that's what I remember to this day. So preparation, making sure that you maintain your calmness on a scene, And then the last thing I would say is that at the end of the day, if you are presented with a patient that you have absolutely no idea what is going on, they have that weird random disease process that you haven't heard about since paramedic school, if then, we can always go back to our ABCs, right? We can make sure they're not breathing. Not breathing. Ooh, that's bad. We can make sure that they're not (laughs) bleeding. Make sure that they are not bleeding. Then we can secure an airway. We can make sure that they are breathing. They have to breathe. (laughs) We can fix their breathing. And we need to maintain their circulatory status. It doesn't matter what the disease process is, you can always fall back on those principles. Whether you have a protocol for it or not, go back, make sure they're not bleeding, maintain an airway, make sure they're breathing, and control their circulation. And there's been a lot of times that I've found myself falling back to that whenever it is just an absolute mess and you're not sure where to start. Hey, HABCs, go back to those. And that's kind of the steps that I take to... Not not just to deal with that imposter syndrome, but those are the steps I take to to make sure that I'm I guess that I'm performing the best way that I possibly can. And by doing so, that is going to decrease the effects and the symptoms of that imposter syndrome. And that's one of the beautiful things is that you can always fall back to your ABCs, but also at the core of it you can always fall back to your protocols. Except for the rare instances of your patients having a stroke and a STEMI at the same time. What are the chances? Buy a lottery ticket, my guy. <laughs> if I would have, I would have have, a, have to work overtime like I do now anyways. <laughs> but uh, no, you can always fall back on your protocols. And that's one of the ones, that's one of the things I want to talk about is that you've written protocols. Yes. What does that even mean? <laughs> so, okay, so. Uh, so the way that this work, I just said uh, three times, and that's like a big pet peeve of mine, so that bothers me. But anyways, so as a, at my program, I've worked as, I've kind of headed up our program's clinical development team, and then I've also been a member of that team. And the idea behind it is that at the end of the day, EMS in many places is a business. It's all about turning a profit, making sure that shifts are filled, budget is met, and all these other things. Any EMS service is going to tell you that they want to provide high quality care. But the, the simple fact of the matter is that that is not always their highest priority. And typically there's going to be at least one person or maybe a department that's in charge of quality improvement, a uh, training officer, something such as that. And that is supposed to be their responsibility. But they are overloaded. They're overtaxed, they're overworked. They are responsible for training new employees, making sure people's CPR cards are up to date and things like that. So they may struggle to keep up to date with current practices. So we came together and we created this clinical development team, this this program, if you will, and the idea was that these are providers on the aircraft who are going to come together and propose, what do we want to do? Hey, I've been hearing this cool new study that we are giving this drug for this, and it's showing success. I want us to add this to our protocols. So the way that this would work is we would come together as a group, and we would just all make proposals. And I'm gonna use the example of finger thoracostomies because this is something that we just added to our protocols two years ago, maybe it was a year ago, somewhere, somewhere between a year or two ago. But we come together as a group and somebody says, hey, I want us to look into finger thoracostomies. And the group has a little discussion about it and we say, okay, yeah, let's take a look at it. So 
we would put somebody that was the head of that program, not the head of that program, I'm sorry, who was kind of leading that project. They would go out, they would do all the research. And you're looking to research for a lot of things. You're looking to research for, hey, how common is this being used? Is it effective? What are the results of it? Just looking at the evidence, because there are a lot of things that may seem new, cool, and cutting edge, and, and they make sense, but they really don't when you start looking at the science and you start looking at the numbers behind it. So they would go, they would pull all the data, they do the research, they'd come back, and they would kind of pitch it to the team. Hey, I these are the studies that I found. These studies are showing an 80% increase in uh, 80 percent increase in patient survival in these situations and as a group we would say okay yeah let's let's move forward with that and and that was the thing was we were kind of working on a, we kind of work on a consensus basis everybody kind of agreed we would have discussion it was all very professional and I really liked the environment but we would come together and we would make the decision we're going to move forward this proposal and then we had to decide how are we going to pitch this to our medical director so we would typically come up with a proposal that said hey here's what we want to do Here's why we want to do it. Here's the evidence behind it. Here's how we're going to do it. And then even going so far as to doing kind of a cost analysis on it. The cost analysis being, okay, we pulled records from the last year. And in the last year, we would have performed this procedure 27 times. And based off of the cost per patient, this is how much adding this protocol is going to cost us per year. So. Once we had all that information put together, we would schedule a meeting with our medical director. We would go in and we would make the pitch. And it would be, okay, here's the proposal. Here's what we want to do. And I would give kind of like a little spiel about basically just uh, summarizing the proposal to them. I would also make it a point that anytime I gave him the paper proposal, that underneath it I had a stack of papers that were all of the printed out research and evidence that supported what it is that we were trying to do. And, you know, he's not going to sit there and read every line of every single study, but it was more about showing, hey, we put in the work, and this is all of the evidence that supports what it is that we want to do. And it forced our medical director. He's very progressive. He's very supportive in what it is that we wanted to do. So it was a pretty easy, straightforward process, really. We would have discussions. He would ask questions. Maybe he would make an amendment like, okay, I'm okay with you doing this, but I want to add this. Um, but really, that, that's all that it was, was coming together, getting ideas, making proposals, and then, you know, first batch goes out, then we would get into developing the training for it, making sure it's added to the protocol book, making sure everybody's trained up on it, and then moving on to the next one. So it was a very interesting, it's a very interesting process that I like being a part of. And I would say that, like, your protocols, I don't want to say they make or break the agency that you're at because now I've worked at rural and urban EMS and the urban EMS agency I worked at in a different state were very behind. We didn't have solumedrol. We didn't have even ipratropium bromide and all that kind of stuff. And I talked to our medical director. That's ridiculous. Right. And I asked him and he said, he was like, yeah, because our, I was like, how are we going to start a duoneb? How are we actually going to like, he's like, well, you can't, it's just albuterol. And he was like, well, medics were given duonebs and then another one with ipratropium bromide and then another one with and i was like well that's ridiculous but that sounds like training more that's, than exactly, my fault that's not that one of the biggest and, and here's the thing is there's probably going to be some ems manager or trainer or somebody out there who's going to listen to this and they're going to want to crucify me over this but i do not believe in protocols that cater to the lowest common denominator right i do not think that you should write protocols based off the based off the concept that somebody's going to mess this up. If you are concerned that somebody's going to mess something up because of the protocol that you wrote, like you said, that's a training problem. That is that is a training problem. That is something that you need to identify and try to train up that individual and try to improve the standard of training for all of your medics. You know, you shouldn't take away the skills and water down the care that somebody is able to provide because you're concerned about somebody messing it up. You should focus more on the fact that you are worried about somebody messing it up and fixing that. And I feel like I'm talking in a circle, but does that make sense what I'm saying? Yeah. Okay, absolutely. I do that sometimes. No, you're good. Because you can also look at it like, we were also told in the urban setting, which is very more high-paced, fast-paced, uh, higher acuity, whatever. We were also told like, well, we're not going to give solumedrol because you're five minutes from the hospital. But like I told him, I I literally had a piece of paper and I gave a timeline. I was like, all right, this is when, tally mark, this is when we get patient contact. 
Tally mark. This is when we start our vitals and treatment. Tally mark. This is when we start actually transporting. Tally mark. This is when we hit traffic. Tally yeah. mark. This is when we get to the hospital. Tally mark. Here's whenever we give handoff and the nurses, because the doctor's hardly ever in there. Yeah. This is when the nurses get the patient handoff. And then tally mark. Here's whenever you show up. It's been 45 some odd minutes. Mm -hmm. Saw you med draw could have already have taken effect in this time stamp. Exactly. And, and then you hit on it too with this, with traffic for example what happens whenever the interstate shut down because of ice and now your five minute trip actually takes 30 to 45 minutes or there's you know the hospital floods or there's a mass casualty incident there are so many factors which can affect that i just i just don't buy into that I, my approach is that i think medics should have as many tools in their toolbox as possible and then it is up to them to determine when it is appropriate to use them, right? I would rather them have the training, the equipment, and the protocols and not need them than to need them and not have them. I look at RSI, for example. There's quite a few times I can remember when I was on the ground unit that I would have paid money to be able to RSI a patient. Mm -hmm. But because of kind of like I alluded to earlier, that lowest common denominator standard, it wasn't an option. So I was just kind of stuck managing this soup sandwich without the tools and the capabilities, which in all honesty should have very easily been within my scope of practice at the time. And it's hard because like, like for instance, working in rural EMS now, I have TXA and I want to give TXA. I love that I can give TXA if needed, but at the same time, at the core of like myself as a medic, I don't want to give it. I don't want that patient. Like I'm trained and I'm able to take care of that patient that needs it. But like, I don't really want that patient because it makes you feel bad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's, um, you know, it's always one of the things that kind of gets me because at most people who are in EMS, a lot of times we talk about like, Oh, the good calls or, you know, that was a good call. And everybody always jokes, like, you know, kind of messed up that, you know, they, uh, you're excited. Somebody got hurt. And it's like, no, People are going to get hurt. I just want to be there when it happens. I want to be able to take care of them. And, and honestly, that's that's what it is for me. I'm not here because I want to see the gross stuff and I want to see all of this traumatic things. But the fact of the matter is something is going to happen. Things are going to happen to people. Disasters are going to take place. And I'm the type of person I just want to be there to help whenever it does. You know, that's that's always been kind of my take on it. And that's you know, looking at it on a grand scale, you know, we have hurricanes and stuff like that. I can remember early on in my career looking at the news footage of things that were happening and just thinking, like, I want to be there. What can I do to get me there to help? And I think that's kind of common with everybody. I think back to my start of EMS of baby Alexis as a little caregiver for these elderly people. My patient's having a stroke, having to call 911, and literally standing in the corner being the one that has no clue what's going on. And I just remember that helpless feeling mm -hmm. and just thinking to myself, I never want to be in this situation ever again. If you'll remember, that's exactly what I pointed out earlier when I was talking about my nine-year-old with Addison's crisis. For me, that has been a big motivator. It's, it's just, I know what it feels like to not know what to do or to not be able to help. So I want to take the steps to make sure that I'm never in that position again. So I totally sympathize with that. I don't know. Personally, I like working in rural EMS versus urban because yeah. I'm more, I would say versatile and I'm able to p manage a patient better. Like it's, I saw this thing on Facebook one time of one of those like EMS groups where it was like, I would trust a rural medic over an urban one because the rural ones can manage a patient for 15, 20, 30 minutes versus an urban medic just like patches the patient together and gets them to the hospital. Yeah. And then you, so kind of, I don't know if I said it or not, the financial aspect of like, well, you guys are so close, the hospital can just push X, Y, Z. Right. So, um, I don't know. It also, good segue. Here we are. Here's where we were. In rural EMS, you have your protocols and stuff like that, but you also have to fall back on your education of outside of a protocol. I would say it's why are we using that protocol? Not just patient has chest pain, use this. But it's also like, you know, the education behind why the patient is presenting this way, pathophysiology of it. 
that's personally how I look at it. No, and, and, and it, you're you're absolutely right. I think that's a lot. Um, there's been a shift that I've noticed in a lot of agencies, especially the ones that are really progressive, where they are moving away from referring to something as protocols and they're referring to it as guidelines. And the idea is that for you to be a really good, in my opinion, a really good paramedic, you have got to understand anatomy, physiology, and pathophysiology. Because it's all well and good to do this cookbook medicine where we say, I saw A, I did B, because that's what the protocol says. But for you to be able to identify the outliers to that and to be able to think critically whenever the patient doesn't exactly match that protocol, that's going to rely on you having that solid foundational understanding of A and P and pathophysiology. So I think you're, you're absolutely right about that. And what you were talking about as far as somebody who's a rural medic versus an urban medic, I did a lot of, I was a, for the last few years before I went to air medical, I was working in a very rural area where we were anywhere from 30 to 45 minutes away from a facility any time that we got a call. And I feel like that was a very shaping time in my career. I felt like that made me into a really, really strong medic because I was having to deal with these patients for a whole lot longer. So it wasn't just, I've got a really critical patient. If I'm not sure what to do, I can tell my partner to drive really fast and we're going to be at the hospital before anything happens. It was... I have to sit on this patient. I have to manage them for the duration of my transport, which honestly tied in really well to my transition to the flight and critical care environment where I was asked to do much of the same with our, you know, with these higher acuity patients. So, no, I wholeheartedly agree with you on that. And that's what you never stop learning in EMS. It's more, I think you might have said it or it might have been on the unreleased, (laughs) unrelinquished episode. Yes, the secret one. (laughs) Um, but you never stop learning in EMS. And once you get your patch, you know, pat on the back, it's great. Good job. But also it is so much more, it's like you're unlocking a door into yes. everything else. And yeah. So we actually, we saved that for the end of the last episode. But we're going to talk about it right now. One of the things that I always like to highlight is, hey, you graduated, you got your EMT, you got your paramedic, you got your advance, you got whatever it is you got. Well, Congratulations, good job, you met a minimum requirement. You met the minimum requirement that the NREMT has put out to become a paramedic. Don't get me wrong, it's great. It's something that you should be proud of. It's an accomplishment, it's very hard. But you also have to recognize where you are. It is just now beginning. And now you're responsible for building upon that minimum educational standard with your continuing education, with your experience, with learning from your experience. We've probably all met those people who are straight out of paramedic school. You know, we always call them the paragods, right? They got their patch and they think they're something because they don't recognize that patch is just a minimum accomplishment. That is the minimum standard that you've met. And we always talk about, hey, they're going to get humbled at some point. And this kind of leads back into what we were talking about, about um, the imposter syndrome kind of situation, right? They are going to encounter that patient that's going to challenge them and give them that reality check, that gut check that says, hey, you don't know everything like you think you do. So if you really want to be successful and you want to be a good provider in this field, it's all about understanding that and continuing to learn and continuing to expand your knowledge. Um, And once again, I feel like I'm kind of rambling a little bit, but I think that's a really important take-home point to, to drive home. And Cecil, that's one of the things I want to highlight about you is that not only do you have humility behind you, you've taught ventilator management. You've written the script for ventilator management courses, and that's not easy. The education side of EMS is something that like, I personally want to divulge into, but it's just, it's such a broad field. So tell me about your experience in that and something that the listeners can learn from. Yeah, so I got into education, not, not because I decided, oh, I want to be an instructor. Honestly, my first venture into the professional educational field was I became a CPR instructor because I said, I want to teach CPR classes on the side so I can make extra money. Cool. Haha. I got some dummies. I got a couple ADs. I'm going to go out here. I'm going to start teaching classes. Once I started doing it, I found a couple things. One was that I found, hey, I really, I really like doing this. Like, I really enjoyed it. And secondly, I found that in, in my opinion and, and from listening to student feedback, I, I was good at it. I was able to flow with it. I love interacting with people. I love talking with people. And that's a lot of what education is. It's just, are you a people person? Are you able to get along with people? And then the last thing I realized is 
really the impact that you can have whenever you're teaching somebody. So we talk about whenever somebody's going into a school and you ask them, why did you get into EMS? One of the most common answers you're going to get is, I want to be able to help people, right? That's probably what everybody says. And that is, that is true. At some level, we all do this because we want to help people. But I'm helping one patient at a time. I have one patient in the back of my truck. I take care of them. I drop them off, and I go pick up another one. Whenever I'm teaching somebody, the impact that I have is expanded so far beyond the confines of the back of my truck in that classroom. Now, somebody that I taught CPR to goes on and uses it on a bystander at Walmart one day. Well, I, I taught them those skills. Indirectly, I had an impact on that patient's outcome. As an instructor, one of the best things that has ever happened to me is whenever I have students that come back and they say, hey, listen, I had this patient who presented with XYZ, and I remember what you taught us in this class, and you said to look for this and to do this. I did it, and it worked. And to, as an instructor, and anybody who's listening as an instructor is going to say the same thing, that is one of the best feelings because it's like, holy cow, not only did what I say stuck, but what I said actually made a difference in the outcome of a patient. So it, it's another way for me to, because I mean, I, I want, I'm one of those. I want to be able to help people. I like helping people. And teaching something that I enjoy and something that I found that I'm good at is a way to do that on a much larger scale. You know, so that's kind of how that's happened. So, you know, I started off as a CPR instructor, went on. ACLS PALS, became an EMT and a paramedic instructor, and then I was fortunate enough to be given the opportunity. I began working at a company providing a flight and critical care paramedic education. I was, I was promoted up to their director of education, which was really exciting because in that role I was responsible for um, writing and developing curriculum, also managing kind of the business side of things, which was, that was a whole nother thing, which uh, can't even get into on this, but that was a big learning experience too. Um, so yeah, education is definitely something I've really enjoyed and I've kind of found to be a passion and it's, it's really rewarding and I like it a lot. Cause I feel like there's a lot of, a lot of what you exude is excellence in education and passion. And so like, I think back to whenever, I think on your spectrum, there's like, there's a certain aspect of when I think back to whenever I had my first paramedic partners and they were teaching me what is a 12 lead, how to set it up and what does it mean to start fluids? What does it mean to X, Y, Z, like the basics to where now you're teaching what is chest compressions and the importance of it and making those lasting impressions that really makes a difference in EMS, not just for our patients that we encounter, but keeping that passion alive for future providers. Mm -hmm. and, and, and honestly, I love that you, the fact that you used the word passion because I think that in EMS, public service, fire departments, law enforcement, all these things as a whole, a lot of times passion is looked down upon because you get the, the new guy, right, and what do we all call it? The Ricky Rescue. Ricky Rescue showed up to work with his Batman belt of raptor <laughs> shears and a glove pouch and a flashlight. That was me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so what? What does it matter? How does it impact you that this guy showed up excited about his job? Yeah, maybe it's not the most convenient thing that he's got all this stuff on his belt, but guess what? It doesn't affect you. He's excited. He's going to learn. He's going to identify, okay, this doesn't really work. I don't care. I'm going to take this off. But we have almost this culture of the cool guy is the crusty old paramedic who's burnt out and is like, rah, 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 I've been doing this for 20 years and, and beats down on the new guys and, and you almost just eat our young. Yeah. You know, we, we try to, you know, you see somebody on shift and they're studying, they're listening to a podcast, they're reading a book to try and continue their education. And it's almost, it's almost as if it's hammered out. You know, we, we don't encourage it and we call them whackers or Ricky Rescue or all these other things and we make it seem like a bad thing when in all actuality that is what we should be striving for. We should be trying to be that guy who is passionate, who wants to learn more, who wants to better themselves and prepare themselves for the next call, for the next patient. And that's if you ask me, that's kind of just a responsibility of the job. That's what's expected of you. And and I think passion is a really good word for something that we all should have and try to support in our field as a whole. Very much. Um, 
and kind of another avenue of who you are, your passion for all of the things you've got behind your last name. Um, tell me about what does it even mean to get your tactical paramedic and like in being in the Louisiana Guard and how that helps with your experience in EMS and vice versa. What What is all of that for you? Yeah, so it's a very broad concept. So let me let me kind of start, I guess, with the guard side of things. So I joined the Louisiana National Guard in 2019. I was kind of a late bloomer. I was 24 whenever I joined, and that was very different than most people, right? Most guys who are people, whenever they join the military, they're doing so 17, 18 years old, straight out of high school, and they're doing it, then they get on with their life. I was 24 at the time. I'd already been a flight paramedic for a few years, and I decided this was something I wanted to do. So going into it, you know, I had a little bit more real-life experience, not just as a medic, but just being an adult in general. So went through boot camp, went through advanced individuals training, which is where they teach you, like, hey, here's how to be a flight medic. Or, no, I'm sorry, this is where they teach you, here's how to be a combat medic, because that's how you start off in the Army, is you start off as a combat medic, and then you can branch off into the cool stuff, like being a flight medic or a special operations medic and all that stuff. So joined, went in, did all that, came back, and I was working as just a generic 68 whiskey for the Army, just a combat medic. I was kind of in a clinic for a unit. Excuse me. Um, and then I was able to eventually transition into a, a flight medic slot. So being a flight medic on a UH-60 Blackhawk, go dust off. And, you know, that was very, ob very obviously there were a lot of things that carried over from my civilian experience to the military side. I was already familiar with functioning as a critical care flight paramedic, you know, taking care of patients, doing interfacility transfers, and... I was just having to make the transition from doing it civilian side in an EC-135 to doing it on the military in a UH-60 Blackhawk, which comes with a lot of other different challenges. You know, for one thing, obviously on the military side, we are looking at we may be having to deal with a with a hostile environment, a combat environment in a, in a deployed zone. Um, on the military, something that a lot of people don't realize is just because you're a medic doesn't mean I'm just sitting in the back twiddling my thumbs waiting on a patient. It means that we are considered crew members. We're actually considered a non-rated crew member. So we are responsible for the operations of that aircraft. So we help with inspecting the aircraft, operating the aircraft. We have specific checklists and things that we do while we're flying around, you know, helping call the pilot into landing zones and things such as that. So it's not just I'm going to sit in the seat and wait till I get a patient. There's so much more that comes into play, which honestly I really appreciate because I feel like it expanded my knowledge base of everything like that. Um, well, anyway, so yeah, so there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of crossover back and forth from there. You know, each obviously complements the other. Stuff I learned civilian side benefits me military side. Some of the tips and tricks I learned military side help me out on the civilian side and then moving into talking a little bit about like the tactical side of things so I was as I said earlier I think a lot of times I just happen to know the right people at the right time so a few years back I was approached by a good buddy of mine who asked if I would be interested in working as a uh, medic for our sheriff's office SWAT team and I was like man that's that's really cool I want to do that so jumped all over the opportunity and a lot of it does tie into some of the stuff I learned military side as a combat medic, you know, there is a different philosophy whenever we're talking about operating in a, in a tactical setting. You know, we have to, anybody who's familiar with TCCC, Tactical Combat Casualty Care, knows that there's a delineation of what are you going to do and when are you going to do it. You know, if we are actively getting shot at, I'm not worried about listening to your bowel sounds. I'm worried about <laughs> returning fire, neutralize the threat, place a tourniquet, and move to cover. And... So that was a little bit of a different methodology. And then you can kind of expand it out from there. And that's ultimately what the TPC, which is the Tactical Paramedic Certified Certification, is. It's saying that you fully understand this broad variety of things. So it's not just patient care. It is TCCC methodology. It is legal considerations of somebody as acting as a medic with law enforcement. It has questions about tactical operations. You know, how are you going to conduct yourself in these environments? There are questions about 
a canine cash to care, which was really cool for me. You know, if you're working with a canine, how are you going to take care of them whenever they're injured? Because you're the medical personnel. And then there's also the operational medicine, which I think is what they call it, side of things, which honestly to me is one of the more rewarding things about it. So what that is basically saying is I am that team's medic. These are my guys. And if you ever hear me talk about, like, the guys on my SWAT team, that's that's how I refer to them. I'm like, those are my guys. And whenever they're going out and they're doing something, I want to be there. Because if something happens to one of my guys, I want to be there to take care of them. And that doesn't necessarily mean, hey, if they get shot, I want to be there. No, that's – we're doing a training event. One of them rolls their ankle. I want to be there to help them. I want to be there, to, you know, to put ice on it, to help them splint it. You know, so I can't tell you how many times at a training event it's like, man, I got a headache, doc. You got some ibuprofen? Yeah, I got you. You know, it's a whole nother aspect of being a paramedic that I never really considered. Because now it's not just somebody called 911 and I'm showing up to fix them. Now it's like, these are my guys. This is my team. And I'm going to do everything I can to take care of them in any way possible. Whether it's they get shot, I'm going to put a tourniquet on, they need ibuprofen, or maybe things got a little out of hand at the Christmas party and they're all they, they're all strung up in the backyard with some fluid. Right, right. Because that def- <laughs> I'm not saying, I can neither confirm nor deny that that has happened, but, you know, it's a, it's, it's a camaraderie about that that I really enjoy. And uh, I hope... If any of you guys listen to this podcast, don't don't hold it against me that I'm getting sentimental about y'all, but I really care about y'all a lot. <laughs> <laughs> you need a tissue. I need a tissue. No. <laughs> I don't know if y'all could tell, but that was supposed to be like my emotional sound effect. It was definitely visual, but maybe not audio. <laughs> oh, well. Hopefully it carried over. So, Cecil. <sighs> you spent, serious. <laughs> you've spent 11 years in EMS total. Uh, since 2012 yeah 11 years now 11 years I'm sure you've had plenty of calls yes. plenty of calls many reports many tickets written what would you say is the craziest call you've ever had see and I just talked about this same call on the unreleased <laughs> episode but now I feel like I need to think of a different one because I'm like man there's got to be something better than that alright same thing we do with the last episode cue the Jeopardy music Okay, so, craziest call I ever had. This is a really hard one to think of. So, I'm going to just rapid fire throw out all the random different things that I can think of. So, one time I got a call for a lady, said she was in distress. We showed up. She's living in this camper trailer in the middle of a big field. Hard to find, literally the middle of nowhere. We showed up. She told us to cut the locks on the gate because... That was the only way to get in there. She couldn't come to the gate. So we cut the locks, or say that, the fire department cut the locks. We showed up, and the lady's obviously having some form of a psychiatric emergency, and she's talking about she needs to get out of here. The people are keeping her there. She has information on them. All these other things just kind of going on and on about it. So we recognize what's going on. We're like, okay, you know, we're going to get you there. Um, We're working on bringing her out of the trailer, and she says, hey, I need to get my bag. And she points towards this duffel bag in the corner with a bunch of clothes and a Bible and some other stuff in it. So I'm like, okay, these are all our belongings. So we grabbed the duffel bag. We're walking out. And as we're walking her out, this pickup truck pulls up to the trailer. And this guy gets out. And the lady starts kind of panicking a little bit. She was like, that's him. They're, they're the ones keeping me here. They're the ones keeping me here. And I said, okay, you know, we're going to take care of you. And I'm like, you know, sir, can I help you with anything? And the guy's just kind of standing there menacingly and he's staring at us and whenever I asked him anything he just kind of grunted he was like mm, rr, 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 rr. he didn't say anything I said uh so we're walking down the steps and I, and I, I kind of I'm watching this guy and that's when I realized he has a pistol tucked into the waistband of his pants and I'm like uh that's not cool and then I look behind him and I realize that this little I guess it was either a Ford Ranger or a little Isuzu pickup truck it's one of those small ones but I could not count how many different rifles and shotguns he had in the front seat of that truck. And I just, mm, this isn't good. So I looked at my partner who was helping me walk around the steps. I said, we need to go. And he said, what are you talking about? I said, we need to go. And right. he's and he was like, okay, okay. And uh, we get going. And anyway, I'm like, listen, ma'am, it's fine. We got you. We're going to bring you to the hospital now. We get to the hospital. Nurse walks up. Nurse starts talking to the patient. And she's like, you know, I have information. They were trying to keep me there, and I have information on them. 
the nurse says, well, what do you have information on? And the lady says, well, they're making pipe bombs and they're trying to, they're going to kill a bunch of people. And the nurse said, they're making pipe bombs. And <laughs> I kid you not, the lady goes, yeah. And I got one of them in my bag right over here uh-uh. with the dang big duffel bag that I just <laughs> towed it inside of the ER. <laughs> and me and my partner are standing there like, uh, well, didn't see this coming. You know, she she neglected to provide that information to us. So, and looking back now, it probably wasn't handled the best way because ideally, whenever somebody says something like that, we would, you know, clear the area, call in the bomb squad, let them do their thing. But the nurse actually just took the duffel bag and dumped it out. And I guess she was expecting one of those bowling ball bombs from Scooby-Doo to roll out of it or something, but nothing. There was no bombs in it or anything. So that was kind of one that always stuck out of my mind. I had a few where it was just, you know, the patient access was difficult. Walking a mile and a half into the woods, this guy was shot by his buddy while they were uh, hog hunting. So we had to strap him to a spine board, put him on the front of a four-wheeler, drive him out the woods. That took two hours, and I'm like loading this dude up with blood on the on the drive out so that was pretty challenging um yeah i think that's some of them like i said in our unreleased episode i'm probably gonna remember a bunch <laughs> as soon as we get done with this and you just i'm gonna send you a voice recording to plug in here oh yeah this one time yeah might as well mm-hmm. um and dude that's what's so hard they teach you in emt school of BSI, body substance index, scene safe. And we're not supposed to even walk up, up on a scene if it's not safe. And yeah. it's hard whenever you have a patient. And the one time I got a gun pulled on me on scene was after the police department on scene were like, oh, yeah, we cleared them. Everything's fine. You know, everything's all good. The scene is safe. Police are there. And then all of a sudden, I'm staring down a nine inch barrel yeah. in my face. Oh, that's great. So, like, those calls are hard because even though you have a patient, like if you're not safe at the end of the call and I never respected the whole like scene safe. Yeah. It's me and my partner at the end of the day for, before a patient until that moment. And ever since then, I will never forget BSI scene safe. In, in the same sense that a new paramedic takes that one challenging call to get humbled. It takes one call like that for you to really realize how important it is and how quickly the situation can change. We always hear and we always think about law enforcement specifically as, you know, being a dangerous public service or firefighting. But any time that you see law enforcement and fire department out there dealing with these situations, EMS is usually right there too, transporting the patients, dealing with whatever it is that happens. And and you're right, a lot of times we tend to just write it off as, you know, okay, BSI is my scene safe, but I would encourage everybody to be proactive in that respect of just making sure that if you have a concern do something about it. And if anybody is ever going to try and, what's the word I'm looking for? If anybody's ever going to try and like put you down or penalize you for taking steps to ensure your own safety, that's either not somebody you need to work for or not somebody you need to be concerned with. Yeah. Because at the end of the day, you know, we, we're going home. I'm going home at the end of my shift if I have anything to say about it. So yeah. that's definitely a good point. I had a partner who we had a mutual understanding of he was very much gung ho about like even if the scene is quote unquote not safe or he doesn't want to wait for police, he would just go and scene. And so I would literally there were so many calls when he would just he, we would get the call and he'd be like, Well, I'm just going in. Literally one time it was a patient who was like trying to stab herself or something like that. And he was like, I'm not waiting for police. I just he we parked around in the staging area. He went in, and I just kind of like mosey the ambulance closer to, and I was like, dude, you go in. Like you said, I'm trying to get home at the end of the show. Yeah. That that guy, he needs to reconsider (laughs) reconsider his life choices. He was also a law enforcement officer, like, Uh, in a previous life. Oh, okay. Well, still. Yeah. Much respect, sir, if you're listening. (laughs) I still love you to the ends of this earth, but... He knows. Oh, yeah. I would sit in the ambulance at the end of the call and be like, all right, so whenever PD gets here, that's exactly. when I go I'm in. No, you're in there. <laughs> so, so out of all the calls, there's so many, mm-hmm. so many tickets, so many reports you've written, so many scenes you've walked upon. Cecil, what is the most challenging call? Mm. Recent, past, whatever. So I think one of the most challenging calls I've ever had, and it wasn't as much challenging 
as, as patient care, as much as it was, it was such a gut check and it was a reality check for me. I was still a fairly new flight paramedic. We were dispatched for an MVC. It was roll over. The guy was drinking and driving. He rolled a Jeep, thrown out the Jeep. We get there, textbook multi-systems trauma patient, closed head injuries, got bleeding from the mouth, all these different things. So we showed up. We elected, okay, we know we need to RSI this guy because of his mental status. We need to secure his airway. And hemodynamically, he was fine. He was stable enough for the intubation attempt. So we go through the steps and, you know, we, we pre-medicate, we sedate him, we paralyze him. And I remember I went in to intubate him. And whenever I did, his, his airway was off. It was at an angle. It wasn't where it was supposed to be. And it was at that moment that I f- literally felt that sensation of the hairs on the back of my neck sticking up. I felt my heart rate starting to rise. And I realized, mm, this isn't good. Something's not going right. So I started trying to pass the bougie, but like I said, everything's off at an angle. It's not where it's supposed to be. I can't pass it like I'm supposed to. And then right after that, the patient began to he began to regurgitate. And it wasn't vomiting, right? It was regurgitation because we know vomiting is an active process, which is why we paralyze him because they can't actively vomit. But he was regurgitating. And he was regurgitating all the beer, and all the gumbo that he had in his stomach. Not the gumbo. Definitely the gumbo. So if you, there's a running joke in EMS in Louisiana that if you have to intubate somebody, they either just ate a big bowl of gumbo or a big thing of red beans and rice. Oh. Gumbo, if you don't know, is kind of a stew with a whole bunch of rice. It has a gravy to it, and it's full of chunks of chicken and sausage and whatever else people decide to put into it. And this guy just started regurgitating these copious amounts of gumbo and I couldn't see the airway. So I was like, oh no, this isn't good. So I grabbed the suction. At the time, we still had the old school yonker suction, which suck or they they don't suck, which is why they suck. You, you, I'll get, y'all yeah. get what I'm trying to say. <laughs> and I'm trying to clear this dude's airway and it's not working because I'll get a little bit of it out and then the tip of it gets occluded with a chunk of chicken. And I'm pulling it out and I'm pulling the chicken off and I'm sticking it back in there and... I'm literally just trying to clear this dude's airway because, you know, I can't bag him because he's full of gumbo. I can't put a super glottic in because he's full of gumbo, and I'm just trying to suction. And it got to the point where this guy was essentially was peri arrest. He was starting to Brady down and everything else. So I stopped the intubation attempt. I threw the, I pulled the yonkers off the suction tube, and I threw it in his mouth just to try and get out whatever I could. And I told the medic, to, I told the EMT to start driving us to the closest hospital, which was a small little tertiary care facility. But I recognized that, hey, I need help. I need to get somewhere with more people, more equipment that can help me out before this guy dies. So I managed to get the, I managed to finally get the airway clear and get the ET tube on the trip to the hospital. And we air transported them to the trauma center and um, patient ended up doing well making a full recovery and everything else. So that was great. But I I remember the challenging part of that was just that it was another one of those moments where it was like, hey, I was not prepared and did not know what I didn't know. Because looking back now, if if the Cecil of 2023 had been there, I would have moved straight to a surgical crack on that guy. Looking back now, you know, can't intubate, can't ventilate, can't oxygenate, peri-arrest. Like, he, he, I should have cut a hole and put a tube in. But at the time, I I wasn't sure. That was one of those knowledge gaps that I kind of talked about. That I kind of talked about that I was able to take away from that call and recognizing that, hey, there comes a time when you're just going to have to pull the trigger on that and and do what it is you have to do. And that was something we discussed in our debrief, which I think is such an important part of learning. If you you want to make that transition from being that, as I said, the minimum standard patch paramedic to being a true blue functioning paramedic as you should be you've got to debrief these calls everything you you will always learn more from something that goes wrong than something that goes right mm-hmm. if you go and you were on a call perfectly well congratulations all that you did was confirm what you already knew but if something goes wrong you invalidated something that you thought and you gained new knowledge and new information to use in your next in your next you know as you move on in your career you fixed one of those gaps in your experience. So I, you know, I definitely think the importance of that can't be overstated. So yeah, it's probably one of my more challenging ones that sticks out in the back of my head. What was the thing that you said that your medical director, you had advised, like you were pursuing not using the anchor sanction anymore? Oh my God. Yes. So 
after, yeah, thank you. I'm glad you remember that. So <laughs> after that call, I went to our quality improvement coordinator. I said, listen, I said, this thing sucks. I said, there's a better thing out there. It's called the Decanto Wide Bore Suction. I'm not, we're not sponsored by them. I'm not advertising for them. I'm just saying it's better. And I went to him. I said, we need to get this instead. What do I have to do? And this is what started me on my path of being involved in protocol and clinical development. He said, well, you know, do the research make a proposal, and then we'll see if we adopt it. He said, listen, I'm going to make you a Google Drive folder, because we use Google stuff. He said, I'm going to make you a folder to put all your information into. I said, okay, cool. Um, so I had all my paperwork. I said, all right, great. So I went and I logged into the Google Drive, and he had labeled the folder Cecil's Crusade Against the Suction Catheter. <laughs> and it was almost it was almost motivating to me, because I was like, you know what? You're right. This is a crusade. We're getting this thing. And guess what? We've got the Canto suction catheters now. They do suck, as they're supposed to, and uh, <laughs> I think the world's a better place for it. So, yeah, I'm glad you reminded me of that. I'll probably never forget it. Yeah, that was a good one. So, Cecil, you spent quite an amount of time in EMS in general. You spent an amount of time in in the Louisiana Guard. You spent about a time in the EMS education. You spent a lot of time in a lot of things EMS related. What is your advice to EMS professionals? Don't suck. Now I say that kind of jokingly, right? And everybody probably listened to it and they were like, <laughs> oh gee, thanks. And they're good for nothing. But seriously, here's the deal. The way that I feel about this is is we already already hit on a little bit about the the minimum requirement that you know you met to become a paramedic and whenever somebody calls nine one one there is a certain expectation. I like I like quotes that support things and there was a Chicago fire chief who said something along the lines of nobody calls nine one one says send me three dumb <laughs> firemen in a pickup truck. They call nine one one and in three minutes they want three Olympic champ Olympic triathlon champion neurosurgeons to show up and solve all of their problems. And that is the expectation. These people are calling nine one one on the absolute worst day of their life, and they are expecting you to show up and to be competent and to be able and to fix the problems that they're having. They don't know you, right? As a, as a flight paramedic, I have walked into a facility, met a complete stranger, met their eight-month-old child, and in less than 30 minutes, I was leaving that hospital with their eight-month-old child by myself. They didn't come with me. They didn't interview me. They didn't know me, nothing like that. But they had that trust because of the position that I was in to let me do that. And that is a position that anybody's in whenever you're working in EMS, whenever you're doing anything like this. So you should always work to improve yourself, to rise to that expectation, to, to be able to fulfill what it is that they expect of you because that's what they deserve. The, there's, there's another quote that I've always heard that I've kind of liked in his talk, and they use it a lot of times for fire departments and law enforcement, and, and I think it applies to EMS too. And it says that you know the bravest thing that a firefighter, law enforcement, anybody else like that does is whenever they accept a job. Because everything else after that is just a part of the job. After after you're on the department, the expectation is, yes, you're going to run into burning buildings. Yes, you're going to go into dangerous situations. Yes, you're going to show up whenever patients are critically ill and injured and take care of them. So there's a certain expectation. Live up to that expectation, which is a really long way of saying, don't suck. Dramatic emphasis right there. Yes, exactly. Had to throw <laughs> that in there. So, knowing what you know now, and all of the things behind your last name, and everything that you've learned along the way, if you could go back, if you could Marty McFly yourself. Ugh. Very good. Okay. Back to Cecil Fairchild. In the beginning, walking into the fire volunteer fire department agency, if you could go back and look at yourself, would you say either go for it and do it well, or would you say don't do it? You know, I've noticed kind of a funny trend, which is I don't, literally off the top of my head, I cannot think of a single person who is in EMS because they want it to be in it. I don't know anybody that was like, when I was in high school, I always wanted to be a paramedic. I always wanted to be an EMT. Right. I know so many people that most people I know 
ended up doing this. You know, I was in nursing school and it didn't work out. I was a teacher and I decided to do this. And and I'll be honest, I was one of those. I had never planned on doing this. I had other plans when they didn't work out. I ended up being a volunteer firefighter and, and kind of fell in love with EMS. And with all that said, looking back, I, I would 100% do it all over again. The the experience, the opportunities, the people that I've met along the way, I I really wouldn't trade it for anything. And I, I it's not often, I think, that people can say they feel like they are doing what they are supposed to be doing. But the passion that I feel for what I do, th- this is what I'm supposed to be doing. I, and I really can't imagine myself doing anything else than what I'm doing. You know, f- future career goals, yeah, that's one thing. But leading up to this point and where I'm at today, I, I really wouldn't trade it for anything. I, I like it a lot. That's all I got to say about that. <laughs> In my best Forrest Gump impression. <laughs> two episodes later. And yes, I, two. I appreciate your time. <laughs> you are welcome. You got anything else for the people? Don't suck. Very good. I feel like that was at me based on my last call I ran. But, um, well, that's all I got, Cecil, if that's all you got. Yes. We'll wrap up. So with that. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, or future topic ideas, please email me at 22 at the lips podcast at gmail.com. Again, that's 22 at the lips podcast at gmail.com. Be safe out there, friends, and never stop learning. I'm still thinking about it, and I'm also chewing on this cookie, so you're going to have to edit all this out. <laughs> this episode brought to you by Chips Ahoy, uh, mm-hmm. Reese's Cookies. They're yeah. really good, 20 out of 10. Dude, if I could be sponsored, you know how many financial problems that would... <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to get sponsored by Chips Ahoy for the podcast. That'd be an accomplishment, I feel like.